Thank you so much, Mona. I, there's zero percent chance I can live up to what you said, but thank you so much for saying it. Uh, welcome, everyone. To everyone who has been with us on this journey through all now this the fifth webinar we've done together, thank you so much for being with us to learn about what I think is the most important advance in human and civil rights for people with disabilities since the Americans with Disabilities Act. To those of you who are new or have, haven't seen all the webinars, please check them out on Disability Rights Rhode Island's website. They're all archived there as this one will be. And as I'm gonna tell you later, there's some amazing things you can find on that website as well. Resources that can help you and the people you care about access the services and supports they need, want, and deserve to lead their best lives. What we're gonna talk about today are two things. One, we're gonna do a, a, a summary. We're gonna bring together all of the things that we've talked about so far. Because to me, the most important thing we can do with supported decision-making is use it and use it in a coordinated, consistent way to make sure that the services and supports you people need to access their best possible lives are available to them consistently in a way that is efficient and effective. And two, we are going to talk about a model, a new model that we can use to make sure those supports and services are delivered consistently. So with that, let's begin. What we're going to talk about today is what I call the, the culture of coordinated support model. And it starts like this. What we have to realize when we're talking about any model or anything is that each and every one of us wants the same things. Everybody watching this, everyone watching it on video, everyone who has never heard of supported decision-making wants the same things. And that's this. We all want the lives we want. We want to do the things we want. We want to have things that meet our values. We want the relationships I want. We want the work and opportunities that speak to us, that make us feel unique and individual. In other words, we all want to be self-determined. That's what self-determination is. As we've said again and again and again, people who are self-determined make more choices and do more things. They are the causal agents in their lives, people who do things rather than having things done to them, who make choices rather than having choices made for them. And what we know from 40 years of studies is that people who are more self-determined have a better quality of life. Let me repeat that. People who are self-determined, and this is not up for debate. We have studies going back to the 1970s. People specifically, people with disabilities, who exercise more self-determination, who make more choices, have a better quality of life. They are more likely to be independent, educated, employed, and have more health, more happiness, more safety. And how can we get there? Well, to me, a key way to get to self-determination is through supported decision-making. Long definition on your screen, you've all heard me say I don't care for this definition very much. So what I can tell you about supported decision-making is this, it's doing the things you have to, it's, I'm sorry, it's getting the help you need to do the things you have to do. And that's it. It's the help we get every single day when we ask for advice, when we do research. And again, I say, think of all the cliches about decision-making. Get a second opinion, don't go off half cocked, make an informed choice. Measure twice, cut once. They all mean the same thing. Get help. Because when we get help, we're better able to make informed good choices. When we get the information that we don't have, that we do need, we are obviously going to be able to make our best choice. And what we know from research now is that people who use supported decision-making have more self-determination. Hardly rocket science, is it? If I make more choices using support rather than having someone make choices for me, I am almost by definition going to be more self-determined. And what we know, self-determination equals a better quality of life. We showed that through a study in Virginia where we worked with young adults, to create and implement their own supported decision-making plans and followed them for a year. And the data we collected, the people we talked to led to one inescapable conclusion. 
the people who used supported decision making were more confident, more independent, were better at making decisions, and according to the people in their lives, made objectively better decisions. And even mid-pandemic had a better, more robust quality of life. So with all that as an introduction, a question for you. If you feel self-determined, if you feel like your life or you are in control of your life or you are satisfied with your level of self-determination, how'd you get there? How did you get from where you began to a place where you feel at least decently in control of your own life? You didn't do that by yourself. If we went around this room, each and every one of you could name that one person, that one teacher, that one mentor, that one moment that put you on the path, the person who helped you figure out what you wanted to be, the person who crystallized your goals for your life. Maybe it was a person who helped you write your first resume or get your first job. Maybe it was a mentor who helped you figure out the path that was right for you. And here's a sad and perhaps unsurprising truth. If you are a person without disabilities, as I call it, a temporarily able-bodied person, because we're all that one second away, one diagnosis, one accident, one slip, one fall, one heart attack, one stroke, away from having disabilities. So if you're temporarily able-bodied, getting to self-determination wasn't all that hard because you're part of a system. You're part of a system that is so effective and efficient, you don't know you're part of it. But if you think about it for a second, it makes sense. Your life, people without disabilities lives, progresses more or less in a linear fashion. You have school where you have teachers where you learn and you learn to go to the next step. You might go to college, you might go to trade school, but that leads to a job or a guidance counselor helping you to figure out a path with a job, with a mentor, with goals, perhaps a house, perhaps a family. But you're going forward. You're going forward because the steps along your path are laid out. There is a linear progression. Well, as each and every person on this call almost certainly knows, there is no such path for people with disabilities. For people with disabilities and their families, it is a frustrating path. It is a confusing path. You all know this. For people with disabilities, this is what I hear in every state, and I've certainly heard it in Rhode Island. You are sent to over there, to that person or that agency, to talk about educational stuff. You're sent over there to that person or agency to talk about employment stuff. Healthcare is over there. Money management's over there. And what happens is you're running around and you learn a really sad, scary thing that that person doesn't know that person, or that person doesn't like that person, or that person is a competitor of that person. So, what happens to people with disabilities and their families instead of a linear path is that they spend so much time running around trying to figure out who can provide services and what services are available that they never have an effective opportunity to get those services. And what happens to a person with disabilities when, because the system fails, they're not able to achieve? Does society look at the system or does society look at the person? Well, what we know for 1500 years is that society looks right at the person and says, you can't. It doesn't matter that the system broke down. Society says you can't to the person. And that leads time after time in an increasing way, as I showed you, toward losing rights through guardianship. We are now sitting at a time where there are three times as many people in guardianship as there were just 25 years ago. So what happens is when the system fails, people lose their rights. So we need a new way. We need to get away from what experts call a fragmented system, one that sends you in different directions. I have an article with a partner, we called it a silo system because education is in a silo and employment's in a silo and they don't speak to each other. They don't work with each other. And we're at a time now, and the sad irony of siloed systems is this, we are at a time now when every agency, every support system is being asked to do more with either level funding or less money. They're being able to help serve more people and have less resources and less employees to do it. So when the system is siloed, when the system is fragmented, they're wasting resources. Let me give you an example, sad and scary example, frankly. So I worked with, uh, I, I gave a presentation in Missouri. And what happened afterward was a grandmother called me and she said, Jonathan, I buy into what you said. I agree with you. I don't think that guardianship should be rushed into, but I got a seat guardianship over my grandson. He 
he just can't make it. He's flunking out of school. He can't hold a job. There's no way he can live independently. I have no choice. So then I asked her, who's he getting services from? And she said, he's got special education. So he's got an IEP. He's got vocational rehabilitation. He has an IPE. He has a Medicaid waiver. So he has an ISP. Now here's something I'm going to show you in a bit, but I want you to take it as a given right now. All of those services and supports, in fact, almost every support available to people with disabilities does essentially the same thing. All of those, special ed, voc rehab, Medicaid waiver, Centers for Independent Living, so many other, they're all required by law to focus on the same things. Broadly speaking, they're all required to have goals, objectives, supports, and services around education, employment, and independent living. So I asked that grandmother, I said, would you please send me those plans? Let's take a look at them. And she did. And sure enough, I got those three plans. And sure enough, they all had goals and objectives around education, employment, and independent living. You know what? None of them matched. Not a one. For education, they went everywhere from GED, maybe, to a four-year degree with support. For employment, one of them said, hand to God, sheltered workshop was where he maxed out. Another one said he could be a full-time employee with a job coach for independent living, but everywhere from group home to supported apartment. So I said to that grandmother, of course, your grandson is failing. How can he succeed? How can anyone succeed when three agencies that are supposed to help him are literally pulling him in nine different directions? It is impossible to succeed because their goals, objectives, supports, and services were canceling each other out. They were literally pulling in different directions. How much money got wasted? How much of your tax dollars was wasted because they couldn't work together? So what we need to do, what really that inspired me to think about was we need to change this culture. You've heard me talk a lot about culture. I'm going to talk more about it. We have a culture, not just of guardianship for 1500 years. We have a culture of silos. We have a culture of separation. We need to break that down. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a new culture, a culture of coordination, a culture of collaboration. And here's my promise to you. It's already required. Nothing I'm gonna tell you. Remember how I began the first time we were together? I said, everything I talked to you about is backed by law and science. I'm repeating that. Everything I'm going to tell you that should be done, every recommendation I have is already required. So let's talk about the culture of coordinated support. That's what it looks like. Quick story about this picture. Um, this picture comes from Ohio. I was giving a presentation about this theory there. And afterward, a gentleman walked up to me and he said, I'm a visual learner. Is this what you're talking about? And I said, oh my God, I told him if he colored it in, I would take it and I would use it from now on. So he did. So thank you to Pete Moore from Ohio for this amazing depiction of what the culture of coordinated support is. Let's talk about it. The person is in the center, just like she should be. Now look who is around her. You've got her education system, her employment, VR, uh, a waiver system, DD and her family. And look what each of them is doing. They're talking to her. They're getting information from her and giving information to her. That's exactly what they should be doing, right? Person-centered planning. But it goes farther than that. Look at the connections between the agencies. They're talking to each other. They're getting information from each other, with her permission, of course. But by doing that, they are breaking down the silos by sharing information, by sharing resources. Here's the thing, I've told you that each of these agencies has to deal with the same thing, education, employment, and independent living. I've done plenty of trainings for teachers. And I always ask them, did you get into this field to be an employment counselor? They're, no, we got into teach. I've done plenty of trainings for waiver case managers and voc rehab counselors. And I asked them, did you get into this field to teach? No, we got into help with employment. We got into help with independent living. But here's the thing, the law requires them all to address education, employment, and independent living. But why do they have to do it from silos? If they work together, like you see on that circle, if they're sharing information with each other, teachers can teach. Voc Rehab can focus on work. Waivers and Centers for Independent Living can focus on independent living. Why? Because they're sharing information. Why are they getting, why are they having three separate meetings? I hear time and time again, having the meeting is the hard part. Scheduling the meeting, getting everyone together is the hard part. So why are we having three separate meetings for three separate plans when all of them have to deal with the same goals? In fact, you'll find out that all of these plans have a section called related services or other. Wouldn't it be great 
if an educational IEP could say, yes, I know we have to deal with employment, attached you will find Jonathan's IPE, which addresses his employment goal and his supports and services being provided by vocational rehab. Or the waiver case manager could say, I know that we have to deal with education, attached is Jonathan's IEP. Just like that, each can focus on what they do well while keeping track of what else they have to do while someone else who specializes in it is doing it. And just like that outer circle, they are working together. They're communicating with each other. They're cooperating with each other. They're working from a shared vision that came directly from the person because by meeting together and having the goals and objectives that she identifies, they won't be doing diametrically opposite supports. That's what we need to do. And that's why communication and coordination are so important. I mean, consider the way that different entities could deal with a different concept. Let's say that she says her goal is she wants to have her own apartment. Well, her education provider could address independent living or community programs that can help her, pick, help her do better at daily living skills. Remember I showed you, I'm going to show you again, transition planning is supposed to include acquisition of daily living skills. So the school could focus on the daily living skills needed to live in an apartment. Folk rehab could focus on getting a job and getting the supports and services needed to earn the money to pay rent. A board of DD or a DD waiver professional could help identify independent living supports like healthcare management and transportation that can help her live successfully in that apartment. And just like that, by splitting up the responsibilities into their own spheres, what they do well, we're doing better. And what I'm going to show you, what I've already showed you over these last four webinars, is how supported decision making can link all of these supports and services together. Supported decision-making can be those arrows going from her to the agencies and the agencies toward each other, because we're going to show you, as I've shown you, that SDM is the common tongue between these agencies. It can and should be the linkage because the coordination and collaboration that is the heart of the culture of coordinated support is already required. Special education transition services already must be a coordinated set of activities. Folk rehab program already must become involved in special education as early as possible and avoid duplicating efforts from other agencies. And folk rehab counselors must attend IEP and ISP meetings. Waivers and other person-centered plans are required to involve other supports and services and coordinate with them and not duplicate efforts. So that's what we can do. That's how we can create a culture of coordinated support. It can happen at any age. If it's a school age child, a school and a DD provider can collaborate on education and community participation. Voc Rehab can come in and provide employment. If it's an adult, you can have a Center for Independent Living, Voc Rehab and a DD provider with an ABLE account collaborating on budgetary management, independent living and work. The, the possibilities are endless. The key simply is this, communicate, collaborate and work from a shared vision that is going to increase efficiency, decrease redundancy, make her supports better, make the agency's resources last longer. So as I said, supported decision-making is what provides the link. I'm going to show, I showed you, I'm going to show you again. The student-led IEP, special ed, informed choice, person-centered planning. These are all just permutations of supported decision-making. So what I'm telling you is all of these agencies working with people with disabilities are required to do the same thing in the same way. Let's talk about how they can do it. So quick review, what we know from special education, and as I've said before, special education is where we first learn to make decisions outside of the home. We know that special education is required to provide services and supports that are reasonably calculated to provide educational benefits. What are educational benefits? They come directly from the law. Look at the bold language. Every special education program is required to prepare students for further future education, employment, and independent living. And what do we know is the key component? What leads directly 
to a better opportunity and better results in education, employment, and independent living, self-determination, which means that self-determination and decision-making should be in IEPs from day one, as early as possible. DC Public Schools has it in pre-K, so that when we are doing an IEP, when we are creating IEPs with goals and objectives, and goals and objectives, as we discussed in our second webinar, should build self-determination. We know that students who lead their IEP meetings have more self-determination and do better in class and out of class. We know that students who have goals that are focused on enhancing self-determination have more self-determination and do better in and out of schools. So we should be encouraging and empowering students to take control and make decisions. And we can do that through IEPs, through the student-led IEP, the gold standard per the US Department of Education, where as we've discussed, the student leads the meeting. The student to the maximum of his or her abilities, consistent with uh, their age, so their responsibilities can increase over time. A three-year-old can just say hi. A five-year-old can say what their favorite class is. A seven-year-old can say what they like and don't like. The idea is as the student gets older, the student takes on more responsibility. The student sets the agenda. The student introduces the room. The student talks about what works and what doesn't work, what goals he or she likes. The goal being at age 18, the student is the leader of the meeting. The student does work with the IEP team collaboratively, as one expert says, practicing in a safe environment to make decisions so that the team collaborates with the student, the student works with the team together. They develop their goals and objectives together. They develop what we described as I statements and self-determination goals so that at the end, the student and the team have agreed upon goals and objectives and the student can sign his or her own IEP. In other words, the team supports the student. The student decides to sign the IEP. Doesn't that sound just like supported decision-making? Isn't that exactly how we described supported decision-making? Well, it doesn't just end there because when the student turns 14 and above, that student can take, can take part in what we call transition planning. To me, the most important part of the IEP process. Transition planning is there to help the student prepare for the rest of his or her life. Uh, special ed ends at 21. Life goes to 81 or 91. So in transition planning, you are planning for the rest of that student's life. Well, look what transition planning is supposed to include. So many people have told me that transition planning happens at the end of the IEP meeting. They ask the student, do you want to go to college? And if so, refer you to a guidance counselor. Do you want to work? If so, they refer you to, to a VR. That's not transition planning. What's on your screen comes directly from special education law, from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. First, for purposes of the culture of coordinated support, transition services are required to be coordinated. Second, look at what's required, bold letters. They are supposed to provide education, employment, and independent living. It's supposed to facilitate the movement from school to post-school activities, including further education, further employment, further independent living, and supposed to build adult living objectives and daily living skills. Build the things we all need to be employed, to be educated, and to live independently. I've said it before, I'll say it again. What is a more important daily living skill or adult living objective than making decisions? Transition planning is exactly when we should be focusing on decision making. We should have begun it in pre-K, but it should be focused laser-like in transition. In the District of Columbia, they begin a formal supported decision-making process, identifying supporters, identifying areas of support in ninth grade, so that by 12th grade, by age 18, they are authorized to sign, if they choose, a supported decision-making agreement saying, this is my team. I want them at my IEP meeting. I want them to have access to my records so that we can work together so I can plan the best education, the best future plans for me. Thereby solving the problem that so many parents have said, the school saying, if you don't get guardianship, you can't come to an IEP meeting, which is just completely wrong, by the way. 
anyone can come to an IEP meeting. The person just makes that choice. With supported decision-making, that person can make that formalized choice and practice engaging in a supported decision-making process. You have minimum five years. IDEA says transition starts at 16. I know in Rhode Island, you can start even sooner. So in those years, you have this wonderful opportunity to coordinate services, to build community experiences, to coordinate the acquisition of daily living skills, including supported decision-making. Now look, there's a lot on that page there. School people tell me all the time, there's a lot there. We don't have the resources to provide, for example, community participation programs or linking to adult services. We don't have the time with all of our curriculum requirements to focus on integrated employment. So what I tell schools is what I'm gonna tell you, transition is coordinated. Transition should be coordinated. And wouldn't it be great if there was a way to coordinate, to make sure, like I told you, the school could focus on teaching? There is. Vocational rehabilitation, the subject of our third webinar. Vocational rehabilitation, number one, is available to anyone of any age. I'm discussing it now in the context of transition planning to show you that schools have another option. But voc rehab is open to anyone of any age. You could be 90 years old and qualify for voc rehab because voc rehab is all about work. It's all about the services and supports people with disabilities need to work. So if you're a person with disabilities and you need something to help you prepare to get a job, get a job, keep a job, advance in the job or get a job back, you should get it through vocational rehabilitation. So when we talk now about independent living and sometimes guardianship, the question I have is what if the same things that are stopping you from working to the maximum of your abilities are also the things that are making it harder for you to learn, are also the things that are making it harder for you to live independently, also the things that are driving you to guardianship. Things like inability to take care of yourself and your medical needs or interpersonal issues or communication skills or disorganization. Well, what we've heard from VR, what I've heard from VR, is that those aren't work skills. Those are living skills and someone else should provide them. What I've told VR in more than one case is this. Would you hire somebody who is so disorganized they can't follow your policies? Would you promote someone who has such poor interpersonal skills they get into fights with your customers or clients? Would you retain someone who takes such poor care of him or herself that they're getting themselves sick and their hygiene is getting others ill? Of course not. That means independent living skills, life skills, so long as they're also limiting employment skills, are things that VR can and must cover. So when we're talking, for example, about transition, when the school says, how can we do employment? How can we do all these things? The answer is VR can do them. VR can help with all of those. And there is so much that VR can provide. I told y'all about my favorite regulation in the world, 34 CFR 361.48. This is what says, all of the things VR must provide. Now look at these really closely. I play a little game often uh, where I ask people, name something that stops people with disabilities from working. And in about a millisecond, five people say transportation. Well, look at that list, transportation's on it. VR must provide transportation if that's stopping someone from working. But more importantly, take a good look at that list and look at what's on, look what's on it. Education they have to provide. Employment, job coaches, counseling, job search, internships, independent living, medical and mental health care, transportation, services to family members. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like what has to be provided in transition? Employment, education, independent living, vocational assessments. So what I'm telling you is that when you're working with a student, for example, you have two agencies that do the same thing, that provide the same supports and services, but it doesn't stop there because VR also has to provide it the same way that schools do, just like the student-led IEP. VR has the informed choice process. Informed choice where my counselor's job is to advise me, to support me, to give me information, to give me recommendations about job goals and supports and services and providers. 
The idea being my counselor has knowledge that I don't. They know what the job market is like. They know what the providers are like. I know what I want as the client. The counselor is supposed to help me figure out how to get there, provide me with information, advice, and resources so that I can decide my job goal. I can choose my providers and I can agree to my goals and objectives. My counselor, just like the IEP team, advises, supports. I sign off and decide. Isn't that just like supported decision making? Isn't that just like the student led IEP? So, in the context of transition planning, we have two entities that do the same thing and speak the same language. Why are they in silos? Why aren't they working together? Why are they complaining, as they often do, about a lack of resources? Why are they using a lack of resources as an excuse to not provide services when they can and should be leaning on each other? In fact, they must be working with each other. They must work with each other. I already told you the culture of coordinated support is already required. Well, on your screen right now are the laws relating directly to VR. And they say this, number one, pursuant to a funding law called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, or WIOA, if you've heard of it, VR receives lots of money on the condition that they must provide significant emphasis on providing services to young adults with disabilities. Two, federal law has said for decades that VR must become involved in special education, quote, as early as possible. And last, my favorite reg, 34 CFR 361.48, says that VR must attend special education IEP meetings if they're invited. They also must attend waiver ISP meetings if invited. In other words, not only is coordination a good idea, it's required by law. And perhaps the farthest reaching coordination, pre-ETS, pre-employment transition services, pre-ETS. Pre-ETS, as I've told you, are available and must be provided by VR to each and every transition age student with a disability. Every student with an IEP, every student with a 504 plan, whether or not they are a VR client, VR must seek them out, must work with the school to identify them, and they must provide far-reaching supports and services to them. Just take a look from the regulation, my favorite one, by the way. This is the first one thing you'll see in 34 CFR 361.48. It will tell you that VR must provide to every student of transition age with a disability. Job exploration counseling, help them identify possible jobs for later in life. Workplace learning experiences like internships, like in-school training, like out-of-school opportunities so that they can learn work skills. Counseling on education, post-secondary college training. Workplace readiness training to develop social skills and independent living skills. Why? Because we already know from before, social skills and independent living skills are critical to employment and self-determination flows through all of them. And finally, instruction and self-advocacy to help you exercise self-determination better. These must be provided to each and every student of transition age, whether they're a VR client or not, if they have a disability. And lastly, that regulation makes it clear. VR gets invited to an IEP meeting, they have to come. So coordination and collaboration isn't just morally right. It is legally required. It's not just an effective practice. It is a required by law practice. And you, as parents and as advocates, should be pushing this. The first thing I would ask when my kid gets into transition age, I'd be asking that school what their pre policy is. And if the school looks at you like you have three heads, and unfortunately, sometimes they do, I would just show them this regulation. I would show them this regulation and say, there's so much that you already have to do school. Why isn't VR involved doing this with us? After education and employment, there is still a huge segment of life, independent living, healthcare, the things that we need to do to live successfully in the community. Well, if you are receiving anything funded by Medicare, Medicaid, the Center for Independent Living, anything where you hear the phrase person-centered planning, 
then this is just yet another opportunity for coordination, yet another opportunity for collaboration required by law. Person-centered plan by definition, I cut and paste this from Medicaid.gov, is a plan that reflects the individual's preferences and goals. And look at what it's centered on, education, employment, and all of those independent living requirements, healthcare and wellness, income and savings, community participation, community participation, employment, education. Doesn't that look an awful lot like what we saw in 34 CFR 361.48 for VR? Doesn't that look an awful lot like what we saw for special education transition planning? So if you have a young adult in transition, someone in special education who is receiving special education, then you should be using these Medicaid services if you can possibly get them, if you can possibly become eligible for Medicaid, either state plan option or a waiver, because these plans now are covering the same things. They're another avenue of access for supports and services. And not only are they covering the same areas, they're speaking the same language too. Anyone who's ever gone through person-centered planning training, I apologize, knows this about person-centered planning. You have to determine what's important to the person and what's important for the person. The person-centered plan is supposed to find out where the person is now and metaphorically where the person wants to go, what the person wants to keep the same in his or her life and what they want to change so that they can figure out their short and long-term living objectives. And the counselor's job in that one is to help guide the person through it, help the person understand and learn what he or she needs to live independently so that the counselor provides advice about potential objectives, about potential activities, about potential providers. So the person can choose his or her short, more term, short and long-term objectives and the supports and services and providers they need to get there. Counselor supports, person decides. Isn't that just like supported decision-making? Isn't it just like the student-led IEP? Isn't it just like informed choice in VR? And for coordination purposes, know this. If you have a student who is receiving Medicaid and is in special education, your best friend is Medicaid. How many times have you heard from a school, all of you have had it happen to you or heard the horror story, where there is a support and service everyone knows that student needs, some therapy, some uh, occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech therapy, behavioral therapy, some assistive technology, something to help that student's health that the school won't cover. Because the school will say in code language, we're not seeing that in school, or we don't see the extent of that, or we can offer you two hours of therapy a week when everyone knows more is needed. And God help you if you ask for summer services or wraparound services. And you know, I feel a little bad for the school because of course resources are low, but here's a something for you to know. If a school becomes a Medicaid provider, that is a paperwork exercise. If a school becomes a Medicaid provider through your state Medicaid system, then any health-related item in an IEP for a student receiving Medicaid is covered by Medicaid. Let me put that another way. If the student is getting Medicaid, state plan option, Medicaid waiver, whatever you have, a student receiving Medicaid who has in an IEP a health-related item and anything can be described that way will have it paid for by Medicaid if the school becomes a Medicaid provider. That is an incredibly powerful option because schools now have a funding source. Schools don't have to play the game of we don't see it or offer less than you know or not offer wraparound or summer services because they have a funding mechanism. When I talked about this in Virginia years ago, all the schools signed up because all of a sudden now they didn't have to spend their resources, they could spend Medicaid's. So as a coordination opportunity, when you're doing that IEP, when you're considering supports and services, if your student is getting Medicaid, then make sure you ask that school, not just about their um, self-determination system, but whether or not they're a Medicaid provider, whether they know that if they become a Medicaid provider, they have a funding stream that can support them. Other ways we can find 
individual supports and services. I told you, I just gave those contexts in the idea of a student. Okay, but understand people out of school can use the culture of coordinated plan just as well. You can have VR and a waiver working together or VR and a center for independent living. If you don't know center for independent living, you should. Centers for independent living are funded to serve specific communities. So there's a center for independent living covering sections of every state. You can find yours at the website on your screen. Or you can just Google Center for Independent Living and your town. It will show you the closest one. The point of Centers for Independent Living is to help provide the supports and services to people with disabilities that they need to live independently, that they need to promote their self-determination, to promote equal opportunities and respect in the community. And the amazing things about SILS, one of my favorite thing about SILS, by law, a majority of SIL employees must themselves be persons with disabilities. So if you are working with a SIL, if you're a person with disabilities working with a SIL, you can receive peer mentorship, service, supports, advice, assistance from someone who's done the things that you want to do. You can learn supported decision-making from people who use supported decision-making. You can learn the, the navigate the system from people who have navigated the system. It is an opportunity to learn and practice the skills you need. And a Center for Independent Living is available to anyone of any age, as long as they have disabilities. So again, while I showed you that schools, VR, and waiver and Medicaid providers can work together, it works just as well if it's a SIL Medicaid and VR for someone out of school. We can find ways to have these entities work together because, again, supported decision-making is the common tongue. If at some point in your life, you have to make decisions, and we all do, and if you are a parent trying to help your child make the best decisions, and we all want that, then supported decision making is a way you can do it. We know there are powers of attorney that we can write, and the power of attorney is just me saying to you, saying to Morna, God forbid something happens to me, I want you to make decisions for me. That's what a power of attorney is. We choose the person we want to make decisions as opposed to a guardianship where the court chooses. And we choose how those decisions are gonna be made. So I can say to Morna, Morna, God forbid something happens to me, I want you to make decisions for me, but here's how I want you to make them. Look at the bold language. I'm giving you power. I want to retain as much control over my life as possible, but I'm giving you the power to make certain decisions. But before you make them, you're going to talk to me first. You're going to give primary considerations to what I want before you make that decision. We can do that in medical care. God forbid something happens to me. I want you to make my medical decisions, but you're going to consult with me first. In fact, we can put in a power of attorney, there are certain decisions you're not allowed to make. I never authorize you to consent to me getting electroconvulsive therapy. I never consent to you. I never agree to you consenting to me being shot up with Haldol. We can also, in an advanced directive, say what happens when we can make decisions, like what's on your screen. I can say to Mona, God forbid something happens to me. I want you to make decisions for me. In the meantime, while I can make decisions, I want you to come to the doctor with me. I authorize you to come to the doctor with me. So at times when you don't have power to make healthcare decisions, you still are authorized to come to the doctor with me and provide me with support so that I can make healthcare decisions to the maximum of my ability. So that I understand the doctor, the doctor understands me. I authorize you to be in the room. And just like that, you have made a legally enforceable advanced directive covering decision-making in medical care, both when you are unable to make decisions and when you are able to make decisions. The same types of support can work in the financial world. Finances are the number two reason I hear why people seek guardianship. Number one being safety. I've shown you before that self-determination is correlated with enhanced safety. Well, we can also use self-determination to teach financial management. The story I told you the last time was an 18 year old whose mother thought he could be swindled and was gonna get guardianship to make sure he didn't make bad financial decisions. What we did over the course of the year was we created a power of attorney, language from it's up on your screen now, where we said to that young man, you are on an allowance of X dollars a week or a month. 
And with that money, go nuts. Go learn how to make decisions. Go make bad decisions. Go make good decisions. Learn what it's like to have money and to use it. What money is worth, what you can buy with it and what you can't, living on a limit. If you want to spend more than that, mom has to sign off. So if you want to buy a car for $20,000, mom has to sign off on it. But we put supported decision-making in. Bold words at the bottom of the screen. If that kid wanted to buy a car, mom couldn't just say no. She had to talk to him about it. She had to listen to his reasons and consider his expressed wishes before saying yes or no. Because one, he might be right. And if he's right, she should sign off. But if he's wrong, more importantly, it gives her the chance to support and teach. Maybe it gives her a chance to talk about budgeting, to set up a spending plan, to set up a savings plan, to talk about just how much he needs to earn and save to get to that $20,000. And just like that, Instead of it being a yes or no issue, it becomes a learning moment. That young man receives support so that he can learn about budgeting and financial management so that he can make decisions, better ones in the future. Now, when it comes to finances, we talked about ABLE accounts. And I want to retouch on that because ABLE accounts come up to me in the most important context, and that's work. So many people with disabilities who receive benefits, who are on Medicare, Medicaid, SSI, SSDI, food stamps, are afraid to work because they're told they can't work. If they do work, they'll lose their benefits. And that is a legitimate fear, losing your benefits. The benefits are the things that keep you living in the community, the health care you need, the services and supports you need. So you're going to fight not to lose those. And what they're told and what is legally true is that if you are receiving those benefits, you can't have more than $2,000 to your name. We call $2,000 a fiscal cliff because once you go over it, you are at risk of losing your benefits. So people with disabilities and families are afraid to work. They're afraid to have money. Well, ABLE accounts are a way for people to have money. ABLE accounts are a way for people with disabilities to work. As I told you the last time we were together, an ABLE account is a tax-free account. It's a tax-free special account where people with disabilities who are eligible, and you are eligible if you receive public benefits, SSI, SSDI, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, or a doctor certifies you would be eligible if you applied. So once you're eligible for an ABLE account, you or someone on your behalf can put up to $15,000 a year in that account. That account can be used for just about anything. That account can be used for so many things, and it grows tax-free year after year, and it has no impact on your benefits. You don't go over the fiscal cliff. It has no impact on your benefits unless and until there's $102,000 in the account. When there is $102,000 in the account, SSI is suspended, but Medicaid continues. If there is $101,999 in the account, the person still receives full benefits. And that money can be taken out for just about anything. All these tiny words on your screen are some of the things ABLE can pay for. You can take the money out of the ABLE account to pay for things, for education, preschool through college, through med school housing, like rent and mortgage and home improvement, employment supports, like um, anything, anything associated with getting a job, transportation to and from work, things you need at work, healthcare things, health insurance premiums, medical vision, glasses, assistive technology, transportation, using, taking the bus, taking taxis, taking Uber and other life necessities, up to and including recreational activities, because part of having a life sometimes is having vacation. To learn more about ABLE, I strongly recommend checking out the website ablenrc.org. It's got all kinds of info on qualifying for ABLE, on finding ABLE supports and services, and things you can use it for. But to me, the key component of ABLE is this. The person with disabilities who has the account has to decide how the money is managed. That person decides how much goes in, how much goes out. That person decides how to manage the money. So that means that the ABLE account's entire purpose is to maximize independence and quality of life. And what do we know is directly related to that? 
self-determination. And what is this a perfect opportunity for? Supported decision-making. Because with an ABLE account, I can authorize people to have access to that account. I can authorize my loved one uh, to have different levels of access, to see the balance and see if I'm overspending and advise me if I need it, or to put money in or to take money out. My choice, I can manage the account with the assistance of a supporter. Doesn't that sound like supported decision-making? And supported decision-making follows us all through life. One of the key parts of life and something that people with disabilities do not do enough is voting. Voting is an incredibly important part of life. I don't want to go on a sermon about this, but I've been asked before when the concerns of people with disabilities will finally get taken seriously by our elected leaders. And my answer has always been the same when they swing an election. When people with disabilities swing an election, when they vote in a way that is a difference maker in an election. I never tell people who to vote for or how to vote, but I say vote. Find the issues that are important to you. Vote and vote loudly. Let people know how you vote. Let people know when you voted. Let people know what you voted for so that the politicians and the influence makers know that people with disabilities vote and their vote should be respected. But when we vote, we vote with support. All of us do. Voting is the ultimate making of choices. And we all use supported decision-making when it comes to voting because we all do our own research. We all talk to our friends. We all talk to our family members. My God, over the last six years, there has been way too much talk about voting and about ramifications. Families have broken up over this, but it doesn't change the fact that that's what supported decision-making is all about. It's about getting that input. It's about having those discussions. It's about getting that access to information. Well, people with disabilities do the same thing in the exact same way that we all use supported decision-making to make decisions in life. We use it to make decisions about voting. And that's hugely important because people with disabilities can and should vote. Under Rhode Island law, even people under guardianship retain their right to vote unless the court specifically removes that right. That is different than, for example, Virginia, where I live, where you are presumed to lose the right to vote if you're under guardianship, you're presumed to be incapacitated. So in Rhode Island, even if you're under a guardianship, check that guardianship order. If it doesn't say you've lost the right to vote, you can vote. You should be part of the political process because people with disabilities should be using supported decision-making just like everyone else. But the supporters can really be a key for people with disabilities. They can help a person learn about ways to cast their vote. The options, in-person voting, curbside voting, absentee voting. They can learn how to make a plan to vote. So often it's hard to get to the polls. So often it's hard to schedule transportation or take uh, or schedule leave from work. Learn about accommodations to help you vote. The accessible voting, accessible ballots, assistive technology. Learn about getting a sample ballot. Sometimes it's as simple as getting a sample ballot from your secretary of state. So you can learn who the people are and you can research the candidates, what the issues are that are on the ballot that year and learn about them. And I will tell you this, I went through Disability Rights Rhode Island's material. Disability Rights Rhode Island has some of the most impressive and forgive the terminology, aggressive I agree, it is aggressive voting rights material. Aggressive meaning being very clear that these are your rights and you should exercise them. Don't let anyone take them away. Don't let anyone stand in between you and your rights. Disability Rights Rhode Island has a year round hotline where you can connect them with questions about voting, questions about how to register, questions and concerns about the voting process, understanding your rights to vote and how to exercise your rights accessibly and privately. They provide training over Zoom or in person to groups about topics around voting. Not telling you how to vote, by the way, not advocating a particular position. The only position they advocate, like you just heard me say, is vote. These are your rights and you should not lose them. And one of my favorite things they do is survey polling places. I can't think of a less American thing than an inaccessible polling place. 
Because when you have a place a person with a disability can't get into or a ballot a person with a disability can't access, you are telling that person you're not a citizen. You can't exercise the most basic privilege of citizenship, not because you're unable to do it, but because we won't let you do it because we haven't taken the time to make sure that you can do it accessibly. They also have information and resources on their website. You can go to it under the resources section, look right at their publications, great stuff on voting. Uh, I am sorry for sounding like I'm making a commercial for Disability Rights Rhode Island, but I'm incredibly impressed. When I worked with the protection and advocacy system in Virginia, I managed the Help America Vote Act program. We had nothing like they have. I think it is fantastic and you're doing yourself a great favor if you take a look at it and take them up on their services and supports. And finally, the end of the journey, the conversation, five wishes, other facilitated processes to help people make end of life decisions. And when we talk about end of life decisions, I know I mentioned this last time, but like so many others, I felt it was a icky conversation, an uncomfortable thing to talk about uh, un, un, until my dad um, was reaching the end of his journey. And it made him feel better to pick the music at his service, to pick the readings, to say what he wanted. Because just for that second, you have more control over something that none of us has control over. You can say what you want, whether you want to be in a hospice, whether you want heroic measures taken, the person gets that right to choose. And I believe that should be part of every conversation. In fact, under Medicaid waiver requirements, you're required to discuss it as part of the plan. So what I've shown you, I hope, over these last bunch of times we've spoken together and today is that supported decision-making traces a line through life from birth to pre-K all the way through end of life planning. Supported decision-making is the thing that brings us together, that brings supports and services together. I mean, consider this. We all basically plan the same way, right? We all plan the same way. We figure out what we want. We figure out what's stopping us from getting there. We figure out how to get around it or through the barrier. Well, we do the same thing with people with disabilities. We can go through and identify that person, help that person identify his or her goals, the financial goals, the educational goals, the employment goals, the independent living goals. And then say, okay, those are your goals. What's in your way? What do you need? What do you need to get through to get there? And then you ask, who can help? Who are the areas? What are the agencies that can help? I just showed you four and five different ways. I've shown you more throughout our time together. And once you've figured out who's going to do what and how they're going to do it, you write it down and make it part of their plans. You get that culture of coordinated support model going so that everyone knows what everyone else is doing so that they can support each other and not cancel each other out. But that sounds easy, but sometimes it's not. Um, when we talked about education, I mentioned what I call the tyranny of boring goals. And I think it, there is nowhere where the tyranny of boring goals come up more than in planning for life. Um, we hear the same types of goals over and over again, and they fail over and over again because no one cares. I've seen on so many independent living plans, things like Jonathan will pay attention to and improve his personal hygiene, or Jonathan will take better care of his home to make sure it is clean, eat healthy, and do his laundry. And to which I say, who cares? Because if I don't do those things, who cares? If I'm not really interested in what I'm doing, if I don't have a reason to do things, why do I care if I'm clean or not? Why do I care about these goals? And yes, I know many of these goals are required. Independent living goals are required to be part of so many plans, but they're boring. They don't touch on anything we do. And here's why I've learned this is boring. And it goes like this. Let me ask you a question. I know we're in the middle of a pandemic, so humor me when I say this. When was the last time you were at a party? I mean, three years ago. When was the last time you were at a party and you talked to anyone about your life goals and objectives in those words? When was the last time you talked about your supports and your services in those words? We have disability issues that are so regimented that we're just talking about 
goals, objectives, support services, and providers. And that's boring and frankly demeaning. I never want to talk about my goals and objectives and supports and services because that implies that someone's got to do something for me. You know what we talk about? You know what temporarily able-bodied people talk about at parties? They talk about their dreams. And dreams have become a dirty word for people with disabilities because sometimes dreams aren't achievable. And people with disabilities are told not to dream because if they dream, they're going to get their hopes up and not get what they want. Well, that's where the mistake is made because our dreams are incredibly important. Consider your dreams. It's what you talk to people about, your dream life, your dream vacation, your dream job, your dream car, your dream boat, your dream everything. Because our dreams, even when they're unachievable, teach us about ourselves, teach other people about what we want. We choose our friends because they have similar dreams, because dreams are about values. Dreams are about who we are inside. Dreams make us. They shape us. When I was 18, if you asked me what my dreams were, I had two. I wanted to play left field for the Yankees. I wanted to play rhythm guitarist for the Stones, okay? These were stupid, unachievable dreams. My scouting report said I was too small and too slow for my size, and Keith Richards will neither retire nor die. So I'm never going to be either of those things. So shouldn't I be ashamed of them and not talk about them? No. Of course not. I still want to play left field for the Yankees. I still want to get up on stage with the Stones, but I know I'm not going to do it. But you know what it tells just you about me? Consider what those dreams tell you about me. They tell you that I am competitive, that I want to be active, that I want to stay physically fit, that I want to be part of a team that are moving in the same direction, that I like to be the center of attention, that I like to be informative and entertaining. And I realize I found the perfect job. I found the perfect career. I'm a trial lawyer. I'm a public speaker. I found the exact job that is consistent with my dreams. It doesn't matter that I'm never going to play left field for the Yankees. I get to be active and competitive every single day. It doesn't matter. I'm never going to be up on stage playing guitar. I stink at it anyway. What matters is that I can talk to people. I can talk to you. I can inform. I can entertain. So my dreams shaped me. And what we need to do is empower people with disabilities to dream and build supports and services around them. So I have talked around this country about a thing I call dream-inspired planning. And that's where I want to finish up this culture of coordinated support idea, because it's all about it. Three steps. We encourage the person to dream, to identify and communicate his or her dream. I have lectured, I have worked with high school students, usually what they call the challengers class, the ones that are the most likely to drop out. We do an exercise called dream boarding. Nothing magic about it. Go to Pinterest, type in interest board, same thing. What we do is we give these kids a piece of cardboard, like one by two or whatever, and we put out on a table a whole ton of magazines. Pencils, pens, papers, glue, scissors. And what I tell them is, after we talk about self-determination, after we talk about why they should be taking control, I say, you've got an hour. I want you to grab any newspaper you want, any magazine you want, or any pen, paper, marker, and put on that board. Don't think. Just put on the board the things that matter to you, the things that represent your vision for yourself, the things that you dream about. And once they are done, we do a process called digging. We dig. After you dream, you dig. And dig means getting down to the values. What do those dreams mean? What do they represent about that person? Because again, those dreams may be unachievable, just like yours are, but they mean something about the person. And then we can develop goals, objectives, supports, and services that are consistent with those values that move that person in a direction consistent with his or her dreams and values so that they matter. Here's a story. Worked with a young woman named Ellie. And Ellie, when asked what her dream was, said she wanted to be a veterinary surgeon. In those words, veterinary surgeon. And Ellie was not gonna be a veterinary surgeon. She wasn't gonna be able to pass the coursework. Okay, she had intellectual disabilities. She wasn't going to be able to qualify for class. But instead of saying, Ellie, you can never be a veterinary surgeon, pick another dream. We asked, why is that important to you? What about being a veterinary surgeon? So specific is so important to you. And she told a story. She told about her dog. Told a story about her dog that had cancer. And she went to the veterinary surgeon because the dog had a tumor. 
and they were great. The surgeon came out and explained what they were going to do. They loved on the dog. They kept giving them updates about the dog. They had to keep the dog overnight, a couple of days actually, but they would call them and say how they're doing. They let them come and look at the dog. And um, at the end, the dog was okay. Dog went home, wearing a bandana and everyone was happy. And she said, I want to do for dogs and I want to do for people what the veterinary surgeon and the people there did for us. Ellie is now working as a veterinary technician. She works in a vet's office. She walks the dogs. She comforts the dogs. She talks to the family. She's kind of their ambassador. So Ellie is doing something that is exactly consistent with her values and her dreams. And here's the important part. Remember those boring goals? Now they matter. So you can say, Ellie, you got to watch your hygiene. If your hands are dirty and you pet that dog, that dog can get an infection and die. That's the opposite of your dream. Ellie, you got to keep your clothes clean. If you don't keep your clothes clean, dirt can get into an open wound and infect and hurt the dog. And that's the opposite of your dream. So now the dreams matter. They're connected to what she wants. They matter. And when things are connected to what we want, we can build on that. We want to achieve them. And the dreams and the goals aren't boring anymore. Now they're active and they're personal. Here's a great picture. On your left is Morgan from Ohio. On your right is Stephen from Florida. We did dream board exercises with them. And they just show the different types of dream boards because we don't tell them how to do it. We just say, go, go nuts. Put whatever you want on it. So Morgan writes a lot. And when Morgan held up her dream board, I said, I can do so much with this board, okay? I want to cook an amazing meal. Do you cook an amazing meal for yourself? Oh, no, I want people there. It says right there, I love people and I love to be creative. I want to see new places and I love art. Last I heard, Morgan was working as a docent in a museum where she met people with similar interests, where she got to see great works of art and be creative. And that's how you make friends. We make friends with similar interests. You know, sometimes I get people, their board says they want to be a professional football player. I have no idea if you're going to be a professional football player. I have no idea if you're going to be a professional singer. But I know there's chances for you to play football and chances for you to sing. And if you do that, you're probably going to find people who also like to sing and also like football. And that's how we become part of our communities, by getting out of our houses and doing things and meeting people. Stephen went a step differently than Morgan. He's all about pictures. Stephen made pictures that said the things he's into. Stephen's all about healthcare. He wants to work in the healthcare field. So you can see on his board, he sees himself helpful. He wants to work in healthcare. He wants to help people be healthy. I think he wanted to be an EMT. Stephen went one step farther. On the back of his board that you can't see, he wrote a bunch of notes about himself so that he can take this to his planning meetings. And that's the other thing we tell people to do. You take your dream board to your planning meetings. It's not art. If it's art, you're wasted your time. You take it right to that IEP meeting, right to that IPE meeting, right to that waiver meeting. You put it on the table and you say, this is who I am and this is what I want. How are we going to get there? And that's what he does. And they build services and supports consistent with that dream. And it works. Remember, I promised you, no hippie trippy vaporware. Processes these like this work. Project Renew has been done around the country, not as specific as the culture of coordinated support model, but also works with students. It's all based on self-determination. Students set their educational goals and they set the processes to reach them. And there is coordination around education, employment, and independent living. Well, focusing on those things, focusing on bringing those things together, very first year they did the program. And this was based also on the students most likely to drop out the ones most at risk. One year of doing Project Renew, 93% participants find work, 70% almost keep their jobs. Two years after the program, 94% either completed high school or on the way, three quarters in college, 83% found employment. Why? Because they were building their self-determination because Project Renew is all about self-determination. And we know that self-determination is what leads to education, employment, and independent living. I've made culture coordinated support projects in several states, in Ohio, in two counties. We began a process called the Successful Transition Process, the Successful Project, pardon me, which was a collaboration between a school, a state VR agency, and a DD waiver provider. The idea was they were going to identify students at the most risk of guardianship, and they were going to work together to put supports in place and make consistent 
joint plans, no more silos in those counties. Plans with common goals and objectives, figuring out, just like I said, who was in the best position to do what so that teachers teach, counselors in voc rehab, do employment, DD Waver does independent living. And what they did, they wrote them up in journals. Okay. We had one in a journal where uh, in Mansfield High School in Ohio, they talked about how two teachers who were part of this process got tears in their eyes because their students had never participated before. They'd never had engagement by students in the process. Teachers are dying for students to take a lead role. Teachers hate the regimented nature of IEP processes. I can tell you that, spoiler alert, they want passion, they want involvement. So hearing about dreams help them revamp IEPs around those dreams. Case managers talked about learning about what people wanted in the community. In one of them, a, a kid put on the dream board, she wanted to work at Starbucks. Her parent had no idea she wanted to work at Starbucks, but learning just that simple thing allowed them to put supports and services in place that would help that young lady learn customer service, learn independence to work with people. And she's working at Starbucks. And my personal favorite is people who use their dream boards and IEP meetings. This one talked about a young woman who made her dream, who said she wanted to be a fashion designer. And God bless that school, they ran with that dream because they made fashion design the basis for all of her goals. Like if you wanna be a fashion designer, you're going to have to write your ads. You're gonna to have to write ad copy, which now became English goals and writing goals. So her grammar and her literacy and her reading and writing now connected to her dream of being a fashion designer. If she's gonna be a fashion designer, she has to budget and pay taxes. And there's her math goals. She could be told, you wanna do this, you gotta learn how to make a budget. And budgets are just math. Addition and subtraction and division. How much money do you have? How much money can you spend? So instead of memorizing multiplication tables, we can figure out what we have to pay for rent or what we have to pay our employees just with, with phantom figures and give her opportunities to learn that way. And other dreams that she came out about owning a car and making money, they were able to weave into her IEP so that the goals and objectives you have to have anyway, you know, English and math and science related to her dream. And now they mattered. And now they mattered to her. And she's way more likely to follow up on them. I did another program in Vermont where we did the culture of coordinated support, a school, a VR, and a DD waiver provider with students made dream boards. All these students were at high risk of guardianship. By the way, after a year, none of them went in. They made dream boards. The agencies worked together. Common goals, common objectives, one meeting, not three. After a year of that, like I said, no one went into guardianship. After a year, we surveyed everyone, parents, students, teachers, counselors, paraprofessionals, everyone involved. Look what we found. 100% of people said that improved the supports to students. 93% said there were more supports available now. 100% said it was better at identifying student needs. 73% said it was easier. So if it's easier and it results in more and better supports and it's already legally required, like I told you, why aren't we doing it? This is a way we can do things. This is a way we can change, but we gotta start somewhere. And I wanna end where I started, that we don't get anywhere unless we recognize, respect and protect everyone's right to make choices. The right to make choices is the most basic fundamental one we have. And if I've taught you nothing over these five sessions. I hope I've taught you that, that choice makes us who we are. And if we start from a place of saying, we all have that right, we all should have the right to make choices to the maximum of our abilities, then we can make changes. Because when you demand changes, and this is gonna require you as parents and people and advocates to demand changes, to say, we need to do things differently. You need to collaborate. You need to incorporate supported decision-making. You're going to get what I call the finger wag. I get finger wags across the country where some administrator says, nope, we have a way of doing things and you're asking us to change our way. We are set in our ways and you're asking us to change the way things have always been. And when they say that to you, and they will, I ask you to tell them what I tell them. Yes, I am. I am asking you to change the way things have always have been. Because every time we've ever done things right, 
in this country. Every smart and strong and good decision we have made, every advance we have made has fundamentally changed the way things have always been. Consider 1773, 13 American colonies, always possessions of Great Britain. We changed it. 1863, where I'm sitting right now in Virginia, some people thought they could own other people. We changed it. In 1918, half the population wasn't allowed to vote. In 1963, a huge segment of the population was not allowed to use bathrooms or water fountains or sit at the counter because of the color of their skin. In 1989, people with disabilities were not considered in a legal sense to be people. We changed all those things. Every time we came together and made a fundamental change and we are better, stronger, smarter as a people because of it even though it's hard. Change is hard, man. There have been wars fought over change. There have been social upheaval over change. And when you're asking for fundamental change, like a change of 1,500 years of culture that says people with disabilities can't do things and shouldn't be allowed to do things, it's going to be hard. Because when you empower someone to make choices, when you encourage someone to make choices, when you support decision-making, you know what's going to happen? People are going to make bad decisions. We all do. Everyone makes mistakes. And I guarantee you, someone you support is going to do something you don't agree with. They're going to get hurt physically or emotionally. It's inevitable. They're going to get taken advantage of. I get taken advantage of, and so does everyone else. Bad things happen. But when they do, culture comes running at you, and fingers are going to wag again. They're going to say, see, you made us change. If that person was just in guardianship, they'd be just fine. Never mind that there's no science to support that. But when that happens, when it's hard, that's when you have got to recommit to those commandments of supported decision making, that everyone has the right to make choices because it's hard. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. If you're a parent, if you're an advocate, you already know it's hard. But here's the thing anyone ever promise you it's going to be easy? Any professional advocates, any attorneys, no one got in this field because it's easy. As a parent, you never asked for it to be easy. You were just given it and you fought your way through it. So my favorite author, great quote on your screen from my favorite author, and he nails it. No one ever promised it was going to be easy. Purpose of life is not making things easy. The purpose of life is not ease. The purpose of life is to choose and to act upon our choices. When we do that, when we respect, protect, empower, support choice, we're not measured by mistakes. We're not measured by the one mistake we make. We're not measured by the bad choice, the bad relationship, the bad investment. We're measured by who we are at the end of the day. We're measured by the people we are at the end. And we are measured by three things daring, effort, and resolve. And those are the three things every parent, every advocate, every person with a disability needs now and forever. You have got to be bold, you got to work hard, and you got to be ready to get up because you are going to be knocked down. That's the test. You're measured by how well you get up, not, how, not what happens to knock you down. And if we do that, if we are daring, if we work hard, and if we get up every time we're knocked down, we change the world. After, what, 10 hours of hearing me talk, I'm going to end with a cliche. Change the world. Because changing the world is the most important thing we can do. And it is something that you do every time you empower someone, every time you break the mold, every time you change the culture, every time you help one person. Because the world changes one person at a time. That's what we do. When you empower someone who wouldn't have had choices to have choices, you have changed that person's world. But just as importantly, you've changed the world of everyone that came after that person because it is easier the second time. Jenny Hatch's trial took a year and six days in court. Next one I did, Ryan King took a day. I've had cases where I haven't gone to court because everyone's agreed the person can do it. Point being, do it once and it gets easier. What we are aiming for is a different world, a world where, frankly, people like me aren't talking about supported decision making. It's time to stop using that phrase. We shouldn't be talking about supported decision making for people with disabilities. We should be talking about life and making choices. And someday we're going to. We're not going to talk about supported decision making. We're going to talk about people. People who make their own choices, giving and getting the support we all need. We do that 
then everything changes. And if you buy into the things you've heard me say, if you believe in the things you've heard me say, then we can change the world. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's someone you represent. Maybe it's someone you know. You can change that world and you can change every world that comes after it. If you buy in, let's do it. And if you don't buy in, my fondest wish for you is that you die suddenly. <laughs> That's not a joke. I appreciate the laugh, but it's not a joke. My fondest wish is you die suddenly. Because if you don't die suddenly, if you're not lucky enough to die suddenly, guess what you're going to be one day? You're going to be old. You're going to be disabled or infirm or in the system or need services. And tell me, what kind of services do you want? Do you want ones that build you up, that support you, that believe in you, that empower you? Or do you want 1,500 years of culture to come crashing down on you? I think I know the answer. And if we make that commitment, we can change the world. And I'd love to do it with you. Please remember, my email is on your screen. You can reach me anytime. I'll put it in the chat box. And it has been my absolute honor to be with you over these five sessions. And I'd love to answer any questions. I'll stay as long as you want. Wow, I just want to say that um, every session has built upon the last and that was something, Jonathan. I'm gonna just say a couple of things because if everybody is as wowed as me, they're gathering their thoughts and questions, et cetera. You know, I always write down sayings of yours that I like in particular. And tonight, okay, it's the ultimate. Yes, I am. Yes, I am trying to change the way things have always been done. Yes, 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 yes. I love it with the finger also, wagging and all that. You can also use damn straight. I've used that one too. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, um, let's open it up, uh, the chat box, or just raise your hand, turn on your camera, turn off your mute. Uh, hi, this is John Souza again. Hi, John. Uh, thanks for uh, this great uh, presentation. I've, I've got a couple of related questions mostly from my life experience. So uh, my uh, youngest son is now 45 years old. So I have a history and experience with special education that's pretty dated. So I'm, I'm loving to hear about student-led IEPs. And I wanna ask you, is that a best practice or is that a legally required? And if it's legally required, uh, how soon is it required in terms of uh, what, where a student is in school? Best practice and evidence-based. There are studies indicating that students who lead their IEP meetings do better in school, do better out of school. Okay. Given that IEP meetings by definition are required to focus on the student's unique skills and interests, my advice to every parent is in my advice to every school is to implement the student-led IEP. My advice to every parent and advocate is to advocate for it. At nowhere in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act does it say thou shalt use the student-led IEP, but the US Department of Education has endorsed it and that's good enough for me. Okay, good. Well, the reason I'm asking is, uh, so here, I don't wanna to take too much time, but 30 years ago, uh, we uh, asked our school de department to uh, make sure that our son, who then was 15 and has multiple disabilities, that he should attend his IEP meeting. And the response was, what? You know, whoever heard of such a thing? It's okay if you bring a picture of him, but no, you cannot bring him in. Well, we insisted, it, they relented. Uh, and then we even asked even more, which was we want a couple of his regular classroom peers to be in that IEP. Uh, and uh, I got to tell you that it was a terrific thing that happened. But of course, as you probably know, it only happened for us. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really interested in engaging somebody in the conversation about how do we change that from a best practice to a requirement. I don't see, and first of all, good for you, by the way, that's phenomenal advocacy. And unfortunately, your experience continues. Um, I, 
have a good friend in New Jersey who has a daughter in high school, just attended her first IEP meeting because no one ever suggested it. And people actually discouraged it. Um, I, I recommend that you show up to the IEP meeting with the kid. <laughs> okay, at three years old, if the child is can't stay for more than three minutes, so be it. But to me, it's so important that the student understand this is your team. That's the first step in self-determination, understanding that something is yours, understanding that things don't happen to you, that you do things. So to me, it's day one. Best time to start is today. If your child is 15, start it today. If the child is three, start it today. And the school, in my opinion, cannot legally refuse to let the student be part of his or her IEP meeting. I would do process that in a heartbeat, simply because I don't see how you can form an IEP based on the student's unique skills, abilities, and interests without asking about them. I, I just tell you, at the end of that story, that particular IEP resulted in an idea coming from both Mark and his peers that has been one of the hallmark identifiers of him. Mark loves the weather. And one of his fellow students said, why doesn't Mark give a weather report on the PA system every morning during the announcements? Uh, we couldn't get every day, but we got it once a week. And when Mark is met now at age 45 out in the community by kids that he went to high school with, the first thing they will say is, Mark, I remember you. You used to give the weather. I mean, hmm. again, that's what integration is. Exactly. <laughs> it's finding what someone is interested in and then building around it. Yeah. Uh, you'll pardon the sermon, but disability services are just ass backwards. They look at what people can't do. They start with what you can't do. They find that all your limitations and they start ticking off the things that that means for your life. You'll never do this, you'll never do that. Instead of saying, here are things you do well, here are things you're interested in and build around them. I stink at math. I am terrible at math, but no one's ever said to me, because you stink at math, here's a bunch of things you can't do. Instead, I have found a career where I don't have to do math. I found what I did well and used it to get around the things I don't. That's what planning should be. Your son does the weather well. It matters. He was more engaged in school because of it. So well done, sir, and thank you. I see a hand, uh, Ms. Boucher. Boucher, Carmen, you're on mute now. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful um, series to you and to everyone that participated uh, for Disability Rights for doing it. Has, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, my question to you, what is the best language to use to get a young adult with, with medical needs, right, um, to write a powered of attorney, just at least a medical the person understands it, has it on a napkin, but does not want to put it in a legal document. Oh, one, I'm a big believer in powers of attorney. But if you are you talking about a document that gives someone else power to make decisions or something that gives someone the ability to support that person? You're on mute now. And looking at someone just to support, like when the person cannot make decisions because of ICU or something like that. So the first, um, like I said, the person has serious medical um, issues. Otherwise, the person doesn't need it. It's just for the medical component of it when they're unable to make those decisions because they are unable to speak. The first thing I would consider would be a supported decision-making agreement to make sure the person can have a supporter with him uh, whenever going to the doctor. And Rhode Island is one of the states that has a form for that. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. With regard to the power of attorney, I'm a big fan of simpler is better. 
I'm not a Rhode Island attorney. So I'm always going to cover my butt and say, consult a Rhode Island attorney. And there are several on this call from disability rights. But I think one of the things you can do is just go very simple. When I am in the hospital and unable to make decisions, I want my mom, my sister, my aunt, whoever, to make decisions for me about my health. I would recommend in it, including some parameters for those decisions, what that person believes in, you know? Um, I want this, I want that. I don't want you to make this decision. That way you're very clear on what it is that he does and doesn't want and when that power comes about. That's also called a springing power of attorney because it springs into condition when the person needs it and it springs back when he doesn't. So I would recommend touching base at a start with Disability Rights Rhode Island. And I'm happy to talk with you uh, offline if you'd like. But um, again, at the risk of sounding like I am um, um, blowing smoke, I am not. Disability Rights Rhode Island has very good supports and services on this area. Thank you. Sure. So while other folks think I'm putting my email again in the chat box and say, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I would love to talk with you sometimes the questions pop up later and that's fine. Send them to me an email. Um, I will either answer or find someone who can. I think the most important thing we can do is talk together. Someone out there has been through something that you have been through. The hardest part of being a person with a disability or being the parent of a person with disability, never mind mid pandemic, but in general is the isolation. You feel like this is only happening to you find your people. And there are people there who've experienced it, have advocated around it, come up with solutions for it. So we can be our own connectors. You know, support is not just for people with disabilities. It's for everyone around them and we all use it. And while I was saying that, um, uh, I just saw a note that a, a, a son attends high school and has been leading IEPs pre-COVID since the sophomore year. Amen. See, that's the point is, is, and congratulations on that. That to me is so important because it's just the involvement. I mean, never mind the science shows it's better, but people need to take that lead role in life. I mean, again, uh, sophomore year is, is transition planning time. It's planning for the rest of your life. And the rest of your life, you're gonna have to make decisions and you might as well practice it. The student-led IEP is a great way to do it. Jonathan? Yes. This is Heidi Showstead speaking. I just want to say I wish that we had a million of you. I wish that you could clone yourself. I have the utmost respect for you. Um, and I thank you so much for all you've given, and I will be reaching out to you in the future. I hope you come to Rhode Island in the future. <coughs> but one of, one of the main points I want to make is the things that you suggest doing for people with disabilities. I myself am legally blind, am severely disabled, and have cerebral palsy. Um, but one of the points I want to make is like the dream boarding and the things like that, or tailoring the education to a person's goals. That's useful for every single student in the entire school. And if you start a goal for a person with a disability, other students may have similar goals and it may enhance everybody's educational experience and everybody's friendship experience. So bear in mind that even though this is directed towards disabilities, it's common sense, it's enriching, and it helps all people. And okay. I thank you for bringing up these points. One, you said incredibly kind things about me. Uh, and I, I so appreciate it. Um, I also don't deserve it. There are plenty of people out there uh, in Rhode Island and across the country who can do things that are amazing. And it's just a question of finding your people, finding them, making the connections. Whatever I can do, I'm honored to do. But it takes more than 
me or 10 me's. It takes 10 you's. It takes 10 of everyone on this screen saying, these are the things that have to get done. If you believe in the things that I've said, tell two people. Just like that, you're more effective than me. Because if you tell two people and tell them to tell two people, then it's a landslide of information. So second, you're 100% right. In fact, there's an entire educational theory called IEP for all, which is based around exactly what you said. Everyone's education should be based on their individual supports, individual abilities, individual interests. It's just not legally required. The things I've talked about today are focused specifically for people with disabilities because they're legally required. I encourage anyone to argue for this for every single student. I, I completely believe in it. Uh, the good news is that for people with disabilities, it is legally required, and we should take advantage of that every day to make sure the services and supports are properly tailored and properly delivered. Thank you so much. I look forward to working with you in the future, and, and God bless, and please keep doing what you're doing, because people are blessed to know you and to have you in the corner. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk anytime. Any more questions from anyone? Comments? Just want to uh, point out Kate Bowden on our call, who is our voting rights specialist attorney at Disability Rights Rhode Island, is responsible for all of our great material that we have on the website and trainings and all kinds of information throughout the state. So thank you, Kate, and please give us a call. Give Kate a call if you need any help with voting. It's tremendous work. Um, again, I, I am involved in some form or another in just about every state, and I've not seen any protection advocacy system with the wide range of work and resources that I've seen from Rhode Island. So please take advantage of it and please vote. Thank you. So, Amorta, hi, this is John. Just one more comment uh, directed to you, frankly. Uh, Thank you so much for organizing this and, and uh, getting it recorded and making it available. It has occurred to me as I've been watching that I wish I had had the ability to bring my cell phone into a meeting and when somebody that I was having a problem with, I would just say, here, learn something and uh, run a, a little segment. So I want to make sure that when you put this stuff electronically up and available, make sure it's compatible with uh, mobile devices like uh, cell phones and uh, iPads. Because I can see somebody uh, flipping right to it and getting right to you know, the issue that needs to be uh, learned by the other people in the room. Yeah, thank you, John. That's a great idea, and uh, we will do that. And I should acknowledge Bruce Conklin here, who's probably behind the scenes, who's running everything that needs to be run so that this goes smoothly. I'm sure he will figure that out. Oh, he just mentioned it. it's also on our YouTube page. It links through our YouTube page. So. Well, if there are no other questions, and Jonathan, I have a feeling there will be lots of people getting in touch with you at various points. Um, it is a bittersweet feeling to close out this webinar, although I feel sure that we'll be working together again in some capacity in Rhode Island. Um, I cannot thank you enough for what you have given us throughout this series and what we have now as a resource on our page um, that lives there for people to see anytime they need it. Uh, and closing it out the way you did tonight with dreams, I want to add my personal thanks to you for having the courage and the commitment to stick with the message that we all believe in, but we don't hear enough, which is if we work together, if we understand how connected we all are, 
all of us, we really can change the world. And that's why all of us are doing what we're doing. So I must admit that a few things you said tonight brought me to tears. And uh, I thank you again. Um, just want to give people one last chance if there's anything they want to say before we sign off for now. Okay. And I'll, well, and I'll, I'll comment by saying thank you to each and every one of you who has come to any of these or all of these. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your advocacy. Um, it's been a great start of a journey. I hope there's a lot more to come. Thank you so much, Mona, and thank you everyone at Disability Rights Rhode Island. All right, thank you and good night, everyone. Okay, good night. Good night.